Throughout the ages, we've marveled at the sky, the beauty, the wonder. And in the middle of the 20th century, we began to believe we could go there. To do so would take a powerful machine, born of audacity, cradled by fire, and nurtured through the precision control of awesome force. The machine, made up of millions of parts carefully crafted and tested, was known as the Saturn V. Liftoff at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Five seconds into the flight, we're looking good. Five, four, three. It is the late 1950s, and the superpower nations of the United States and the Soviet Union are engaged in a race, a race not only for the boundaries of earthly nations, but for the new frontier of outer space. Surprised by remarkable Soviet firsts, the United States finds itself in the uncomfortable position of second place, a position especially troubling for a young president trying to project a vision of a bold new frontier. The new President Kennedy, observing how the quest for space has captured the imagination of the country, searches for a goal, something impressive, but far enough in the future to give the United States a chance to win. Before long, a trip to the moon seems to fit perfectly, technologically difficult to achieve, and remote enough in the future to level the playing field. When Kennedy told us America was going to the moon, just one American astronaut had been in space for less than 15 minutes, and the young science of rocketry was proving to be a difficult challenge. Many people don't realize that the development of rockets is much more difficult than the development of airplanes, because with a rocket you have to generate enough thrust to take off, and that means your thrust has to be greater than your total weight of your system which is not the case for an airplane. Germany during World War II had proven to the world it could be done. And at the end of the war, both the United States and the Soviet Union sought out German rocket engineers to improve their own programs. And von Braun had his 120 so Germans, but he also had a huge number of, a large number of Americans who joined that team and began to work with him. And it was like, you know, it was like the, the teacher and the students at, at the beginning and uh, our, our guys uh, learned fast and they were excited about 
of building these powerful machines that would, would explore space. Armed with a bold vision of placing a man on the moon and a deadline stretching less than a decade ahead, and with the help of an experienced team of rocket engineers who had always dreamed of the challenge, the United States asked the first questions about how to get to the moon. What kind of vehicle would be needed and how would it make the journey? The question was not an easy one. With the technology at hand, three primary modes were proposed. Direct ascent was the brute force method. A very large booster would launch a spacecraft directly to the moon. Because the entire craft would land on the moon, taking to the surface all the propellant needed for the voyage back to Earth, it was very heavy. For this journey, a rocket called the Nova, a true monster of a beast standing many hundreds of feet high and clustering large numbers of powerful engines, was proposed. Earth orbit rendezvous broke the mission into pieces. Several smaller launch vehicles would launch parts of the spacecraft into Earth orbit, where it would be assembled for the trip to the moon. Overall, the force needed for the mission would be spread over several smaller launch vehicles called Saturns. And a method called Lunar Orbit Rendezvous, the mode finally employed, was in the beginning considered too dangerous. The method had the advantage of offering a manageable spacecraft weight on a one-vehicle mission. In Lunar Orbit Rendezvous, a rocket boosts a complex of two spacecraft simultaneously onto a lunar trajectory. The craft are designed for specific roles and are linked during the voyage. Once there, the lunar module travels to the surface, leaving the heavy propellant and re-entry protection for the return to Earth in lunar orbit. After landing, it launches a very light return stage back to the command ship for the return home. Once the mode was established, the configuration of the needed rocket could be set. It was called the Saturn C-5. Eventually, it would become the most powerful, successful launch vehicle ever created and would be known to the world as the Saturn V. The Saturn V would bring together thousands of skilled workers, engineers, scientists and technicians on a scale never seen before. There was a multitude you know, 350,000 parts in that thing. And there's so many things that could go wrong. And yet the people would come forward, automatically come forward and say, we've got this problem. We don't know what to do about it, but here it is, and they'd outline it for us. And we'd put together a number of experts, and, and they would move. So it was, it was the buildup of the enthusiasm that made this thing possible, in my opinion. The precision of the vehicle, combined with a force necessary to carry out its mission, made the Saturn V project unique and challenging. Right, it was at that time probably the biggest program which ever had been undertaken. I think in a way it was bigger than even the Manhattan Project because more people were involved and more people who had to make their own contributions which in the long run all had to fit together. The Saturn V, with the Apollo spacecraft, stood 364 feet tall. Fully loaded, it weighed 6.1 million pounds. The vehicle consisted of three stages. The first stage, 33 feet in diameter and 138 feet long, was powered by five F-1 engines. The stage boosted the vehicle to about 38 miles high and 6,000 miles per hour, consuming over 4 million pounds of kerosene and liquid oxygen in two and a half minutes. The second stage, with five hydrogen-oxygen J2 engines, burned for about six minutes and drove the vehicle to about 114 miles high and over 15,000 miles per hour. Its engines consumed just under a million pounds of propellants during its burn. Stage 3, with one J-2 engine, placed the vehicle in Earth orbit with a burn of just under three minutes. The stage restarted and burned for about five minutes to accelerate the spacecraft to over 24,000 miles per hour on a translunar trajectory. Sitting above the third stage was the instrument unit, the brains of the vehicle. 
containing the guidance and control instrumentation to guide the rocket during its flight into space. Conceived in 1961 and 62, the Saturn V would be first launched in 1967 and would go on to travel on 13 missions. The total project would cost over $7 billion and the machine born from the men and women who built it would have a perfect success rate, including sending mankind on a journey to its nearest neighbor. The building of the Saturn V was a gargantuan task, and nearly half of the height and over two-thirds of its weight was in the rocket's first stage, called the S-1C. Built by Boeing, the stage clustered five F-1 engines and generated a combined thrust of seven and a half million pounds. The F-1 engine was actually born before NASA, tracing its roots to an Air Force study for a very large engine back in 1955. The power plant was characterized as a conventional design, but the size was much larger than anything created before. Design challenges for the F-1 came directly as a result of size. Simply scaling up smaller engines did not directly work. One major challenge was the design of an adequate turbo pump to feed the propellants to the thrust chamber. Each F-1 engine consumed three metric tons of fuel and oxidizer per second, and powerful compact pumps were required to deliver the liquids. New materials and welding techniques eventually solved the turbo pump problems. A rocket engine phenomenon called combustion instability also plagued the program. The problem was serious and was a leading cause of early rocket engine failure. Redesigns of the F-1 injector, the part of the thrust chamber through which the propellants are injected, helped solve the problem. But the whole basis of any meeting we had is to dig out the problems and move on them. Because we knew we didn't have time if we didn't find them. And so this agenda was always filled with the speakers who were in the middle of solving that problem. And we tried to control time on the thing by setting two hours initially. It never worked because we'd get into it and, and the guys that, that were charged with solving the problem were running into problems that they hadn't expected and we hadn't expected. But we had everyone there at these meetings that could do something about it. Development of the engine was just one challenge for the first stage. The structure to carry the propellants and handle the considerable flight loads was another. While the structural design of the first stage was conventional, the 10-meter diameter was not. The difficulties faced in the welding of such a stage were formidable. The first stage consisted of five primary parts. The thrust structure was the heaviest component, mounting the engines and transferring the flight loads to the rest of the vehicle. The fuel tank holding 203,000 gallons of kerosene was pierced by five liquid oxygen tunnels and delivered fuel to the engines through 10 suction lines. Above the fuel tank, an intertank structure connected the large liquid oxygen tank above. Holding 331,000 gallons of liquid oxygen, the tank was the largest single structure in the first stage. At the top of the stage is the forward skirt, providing a connecting link to stage two. Fabrication challenges on the first stage focused on new welding techniques. Never before had such quality welds over such long runs been attainable. And with a man-rated booster, the welds had to be perfect. Eventually, techniques to solve welding distortion problems were developed. Management of such an enterprise was daunting with thousands of workers fabricating a vehicle being designed as it was built. Configuration control was a necessity. I then set up an office so that any engineering change coming into us either from a contractor or from the laboratory, and the laboratories were very powerful, believe me. And so I would take a look at it, and one of the criteria I established was, number one, the man that initiated the engineering change must come before the board and I'm chairing the board. Number two, if it's anything over $10,000, the laboratory director is going to come in and defend his change. 
So those were criteria that, that kind of settled everybody back for a moment or two, and they're all mad, of course. With Marshall growing from a small center of several hundred engineers to a large complex of several thousand workers and contractor employees, changes were necessary and sometimes painful. But we did get a handle on it. We did know who was trying to make the change, what it was going to cost us to make, what the impact on the other parts of that vehicle were going to be. Marshall was, in many ways, a research center with a desire to maintain capabilities in-house. But with a project the size of the Saturn V, more and more vehicle development would be required of contractors. So Arthur Rudolph had charts on almost everything which showed him all the details so we knew exactly where things were and the responsible people had to sign off on a piece of paper that they really were standing behind their statements and he had a real, very good control. As the first stage took shape, the time finally came to light it up and test the machine that would boost the first men to the moon. Testing took place in Huntsville and at the new Mississippi Test Facility, part of Marshall Space Flight Center. Huge test stands held the Saturn V first stage as it roared to life. The Saturn V was the most dramatic thing that I've ever experienced 2,000 feet away from a test stand with this giant uh, structure of big four concrete legs that would go up some 400 feet in the air and this massive structure in the center. And then right in the center is this white canister, which is the, the Saturn V booster. And uh, uh, when when they started a test, they would, uh, of course, the fueling would take take place, and you'd see the vapor uh, venting out of the liquid oxygen, and it was pretty spectacular. And then the lights and the buzzers would go off in a few seconds before uh, the firing. And at ignition, they, they had would pour water out on the flame deflector to keep it from melting, and it, it would it would uh, cool it down enough so that the flame would not. Uh, totally disintegrated. So you had this burst of water come out and then uh, as you got down to the countdown uh, you would first uh, see this big gulp of orange reddish flame and it would just sort of hang there for a short time and then all of a sudden it would thrust the full engine power would, would kick in and you see this tremendous amount of power go down the deflector and then go skyward. For a brief moment, it would, you, the sound would not get to you, but when it did, it would, it would just literally feel, you feel, it would feel like if you were out standing in the field like we did in the early days, we had no protection. We would just stand there 2,000 feet away looking at the test stand, uh, the perpendicular to the test stand. That, that force would almost, you would feel like it was going to knock you down. You would feel the, di uh, the, uh, the vibration in your diaphragm, uh, the heat would hit your face and it also would come up with pants leg. Development of the huge booster, the Saturn V first stage, was going well. But it was stage two that would threaten to move the moon landing goal out of the 1960s. The second stage of the Saturn V moon rocket, known as the S-2 and built by North American, would prove to be an even greater challenge than the huge first stage. Clustering five hydrogen-oxygen J-2 engines the S-2 stage came under considerable pressure to trim weight. To get one more kilogram of payload, orbital mechanics required 14 kilograms to be trimmed from the first stage, four or five from the second, but only one from the third stage. But the third stage was already in production, so the weight reduction fell to the S-2. As the stage became even more thin-skinned and delicate, problems in welding and construction became more acute. Unlike the first stage, the second stage tanks were combined using a single bulkhead to separate the oxidizer and the propellant. This saved considerable weight and shortened the vehicle, but added difficult insulation challenges. Also, management of the stage's development came under fire. North American was contractor for both the S-2 stage and the Apollo Command and Service Modules, key components of the lunar program. As the S-2 test stages began to be completed, North American's management of the project was characterized by NASA as out of control. Times would get even darker 
with the loss of the structure's dynamic test stage during a load test. General Sam Phillips was Apollo program director and visited North American to examine the problems. His report, known as the Phillips Report and issued on December 19, 1965, blasted North American's management of both programs. We sent people to the contractor, a number of people, not overflowing him with people, but just disciplines. And you had to go in and find out what the problem was to start with. And so what we did is have the people go out there, call the man that was heading up the program for them out there, and the people that worked for him, and told them what we were going to do, the cooperation we expected, and that they'd be there, and the hours that his, their people were working and our people were working did not matter. Eberhard Rees, Von Braun's deputy in Huntsville, summarized the seriousness of the problem, stating that the first manned lunar landing may slip out of this decade, considering the present status of the S-2 program. We're going to solve this thing. Our flag is flying, but at half-mast right now if we don't do something about it. And uh, so immediately we would hop on the contract and we'd have from the laboratory the expert or the experts that were necessary to go out and help solve that problem with the contractor. And there was no way that the contractor could say, well, I can't get any help or vice versa. And we don't want any arguments about its impingement get back into the contract. We don't have time to argue about that. It did call for, and we fired, not just NASA people, but had the people that were there at the contractor fired also. And I, I guess I became fairly ruthless. Management was shaken up at North American, and the S-2 troubles were worked. But the tough times weren't over. On May 28, 1966, a second S-2 stage was lost when the hydrogen tank was pressurized beyond its design limits. Five North American employees were injured. As flight stages were delivered, considerable rework had to be done on welds and stage components, and the S-2 became a pacing item in the development of the Saturn V. The third stage of the Saturn V Mounting one J2 oxygen hydrogen engine had already been under development for some time as part of the Saturn 1B program. The stage placed the spacecraft into Earth orbit and restarted its engine later to attain a translunar trajectory. In this role, the stage required a sophisticated control system and a propellant management system, all of which were developed and tested on S4B stages flown on the early Saturn vehicles. The development of the S-4B was not without its mishaps. On the 20th of January 1967, a flight stage exploded during testing due to a ruptured helium tank. Corrections were made to the tank specifications and testing methods, and no further S-4B problems occurred. Above the third stage rode the Saturn V instrument unit, the brains of the vehicle. The IU provided a stabilized platform for guidance control and a digital computer and data adapter. The unit monitored the trajectory and performance of the vehicle and controlled it through the final S-4B maneuvers after the spacecraft had separated. Built by IBM, the instrument unit brought the state-of-the-art to new levels in launch vehicle checkout managing the vehicle's testing and interface with ground servicing equipment from assembly through flight. As the Saturn V components became fully developed and the first flight neared, new launch facilities were required to service and prepare the mammoth rocket for flight. Launch Complex 39 was constructed in Merritt Island, Florida, adjacent to Cape Canaveral, and consisted of two pads and a huge building in which to erect the rocket, called the VAB. After being erected, the rocket would move vertically to the launch pad for final checkout. In order to test the facilities for readiness, a facilities checkout vehicle was constructed. 500F was the same configuration of a real Saturn V rocket, designed to allow the launch crews adequate practice on launch preparations. 
the Saturn V facility's test vehicle rolled to the pad on May 25, 1966. It was the first look at what a vehicle to another world really looked like. On August 26, 1967, the first flight-ready Saturn V vehicle was rolled to the pad. SA-501, designated as Apollo 4, would be a launch vehicle test carrying an Apollo spacecraft. The rocket would also carry a simulated lunar module. The Huntsville rocket team used an incremental approach to flight testing, first testing lower stages and building upon each stage on successive flights. In this way, the dynamics of each could be well understood. For the Saturn V, an all-up flight testing method would be employed, with all stages live from the very first mission. In the first place, you were dealing with power that you'd never seen before. You were dealing with uh, stresses that you'd never seen before. And you'd tested and tested and tested to try to get the get misunderstanding, if you will, out of there. Time became a major decision maker for us. I don't know how one would have changed that approach. As with any new vehicle and new launch facilities, problems were encountered, but much was learned. And finally, the launch of SA-501 was scheduled for November 9th, 1967. And it took 24 hours a day to do that kind of work. And, uh, but it was such a pleasure because the people were so cooperative. Once they found out that this was gonna work, once they found out that the costs at least were under control, the time was getting better and better, why those things helped stop all of the problems and start the people looking and smiling. You, you could even see the smiles on the faces as, as, uh, as, this, as the days went on. When Apollo 4 left the pad, the Saturn V first stage was generating 160 million horsepower, twice as much power as all the rivers and streams in the United States running through hydroelectric turbines at the same time. It was the size of a 36-story building and weighed more than a Navy destroyer. The estimated cost of the Apollo 4 mission was $135 million for the rocket and $45 million for the spacecraft. The mission was a complete success. I went down for the launch and, and I was sitting next to Dr. Von Braun in, in the stands down there, you know, looking at the computers and everything else. And he said, Jim, why don't we run outside here before the liftoff? He said, uh, I think, I think you like it and I think, I know I'd like it. So we ran outside and he said, you're going to really enjoy this. And the first stage, of course, was lit off. And seven and a half million pounds of thrust were lit off at that time. And all the vibrations in the world were, were coming down on us. It, it felt like it was all coming down. In fact, the building. And it set up your heartbeat like you, you just never know. You've never felt anything like it before. You were in unison with the engines as they were going up. And so it was so perfect. We have ignition. All engines are running. We have liftoff. We have liftoff at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The tower has been cleared. The tower has been cleared. After the successful launch of Apollo 4, Many who had doubts now believe man could get to the moon until doubts returned on Apollo 6. Gosh, we were pretty darn sure of ourselves that we had a working mechanism here. And uh, so you'd never believe it, but on the second one, we had two engines on the second stage flunked out on us. And as it turned out, we had a thing called pogo. Launched on April 4, 1968, 
trouble started right away. Pogo, a lengthwise oscillation of the vehicle, began during first stage flight, and the magnitude was alarming. The problem, coming 125 seconds into flight, lasted for less than 10 seconds. Then, separation occurred normally. But after four and a half minutes into the second stage burn, the number two engine began to fail. It lost thrust and shut down. Less than a second later, the number three engine shut off as well. Mark, uh, seven minutes, 45 seconds. Uh, we have a preliminary report of a loss of two engines. Uh, this would be engines two and three. However, our guidance is holding well and we're standing by. Having lost 40% of its thrust, the instrument unit steered the craft on a new trajectory. The third stage ignited properly and inserted the spacecraft into orbit. But the trouble wasn't over. The J-2 engine wouldn't restart. Salvaging the mission, the team used the service module engine to complete the program tests of the Apollo heat shield. Work began immediately to determine what went wrong. We had to solve that thing and solve it now. And we called two or three experts in the Pogo world, and we called a couple of other people, and uh, we had help from all over the world trying to, trying to come in, and more help than we ever needed. But we had to solve that problem, or we'd lost the schedule. Pogo had been encountered before. In fact, we had two people that had originally been with Titan for some long time. We brought in a couple of Air Force types, too, because they were heading to Titan, Titan 1 and 2. And it was a match that, that uh, we were able to work from and then find out what the problem was because of the number of engines you had and the reverberation and everything else. So uh, it, was, it was one of those things one never expected, but it was the biggest problem we ever had in the Saturn V. And, and all of us said, we hope we have, never have another one like it, and we haven't. The J-2 engine failures, however, were from unknown causes, and some investigation was required. As it turns out, engine 2 shut down due to a failed igniter line, which was a design failure discovered when the engine was subjected to vacuum chamber tests, the environment in which the engine performed. This cause was also traced to the failed third stage restart. The shutdown of S-2 engine 3 was more simple, human error. When the command went to engine number two, the signal actually was given to engine three. Crossed wires were the cause. It, it worked. The fixes worked. And they worked in time so that we didn't lose a day in schedule. And, uh, but we had, we had our, oh my. Uh, my days went from about 18 hours to about 22, I think. I'm not sure. <laughs> My, my wife said, are you ever going to get any sleep one time? <laughs> Two flights of the Saturn V, one perfect and one troubled, and the time was at hand to put man aboard the moon rocket. 1968 was coming to an end, and a bold mission was at hand to place three men aboard a Saturn V and launch them around the moon. In December would come the launch of Apollo 8. The mission of Apollo 8 was a compromise. With the lunar module behind schedule, what was the best mission to fly in the limited time remaining? A proposal was made to fly the Apollo spacecraft on a lunar orbit mission to test the performance of the vehicle, develop communication at lunar distances, and take a step closer to the moonwalk goal. At 7 a.m. on December 21, 1968, Apollo 8 left the Kennedy Space Center on the way to the moon. Two, one, all engines running. Launch commit. Roger, clock. Test okay, flight. All engines. Clock start, flight. Roger, clock. Hold down the conversation. Clear the power. Copy tower. Houston, copy. Flight flight. Oh, we're going the other Roger, flight out. Roger. Flight, we've lost Roger, the guy. CC, they're switching. Yeah, clear. We lost all data. Get out of CP, that's switching machine. Okay, we still have good data then. And uh, for all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. Apollo 8 was an incredible adventure. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you. All of you on the good earth.
and while obscured by the later moon landing, was an incredible achievement in its own right. The next two missions would creep closer to the landing goal. Apollo 9, launched on March 3, 1969, tested the lunar module in Earth orbit. And Apollo 10, launched May 18, 1969, was a dress rehearsal for the lunar landing. Then, on July 16, 1969, SA-506 propelled Apollo 11 into history, and the lunar landing goal was attained before the decade was out. After Apollo 11, the flight schedule was slowed with two flights scheduled per year. Apollo 12, launched November 14, 1969, was unique by being launched into a heavy downpour. Shortly after launch, the vehicle was struck by lightning. Okay, we just lost the platform, gang. I don't know why it's right here. We had a ring in the world dropout. Got the third field Okay, now we're straightening out our problems here. I don't know what happened. Uh, I'm not sure we can get hit by lightning. The spacecraft continued on its way, and the mission was a complete success. Apollo 13, launched in April of 1970, featured a shutdown on one Stage 2 engine, but the performance of the launch vehicle was otherwise normal. A failure of the Apollo spacecraft caused an aborted lunar mission and narrow return to Earth. Apollo 14, 15, 16, and 17 rounded out the lunar missions, with the Saturn V launch vehicle performing near perfectly. And the last Saturn V was used to launch the Skylab space station on May 14, 1973. Two additional Saturn V launch vehicles had already been produced, but were not used, and are now on display as museum exhibits. After Saturn V flight stopped, the United States began development of the reusable space shuttle for future manned missions. The era of the Saturn V was over. The legacy of the Saturn V is profound, not only for the attainment of the lunar goal, but for the conception and construction of a launch vehicle that is yet unmatched in power and success record. The Saturn V program was directed by the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, under the direction of Warner Von Braun. Heading up the Saturn V program was Arthur Rudolph, who worked with Von Braun in Germany as production manager of the V-2 program. The German V-2 program used slave labor, and in 1975, an ex-inmate of the Dora production facility wrote a book leading to an investigation of Rudolf in 1984. The result, the man who led the Saturn V program, was stripped of United States citizenship and forced to leave the country forever. All of the time that Arthur Rudolph spent and did, our country paid him a poor, poor message. I'm just uh, still sick of it. I went over to Hamburg with, uh, after he had to move out of the country and uh, spent about three days over there with him, you know, and had a wonderful time. And he never got the credit from our country that he should have had. There's still nothing like the Saturn V. But the men and women who designed and built the Saturn V will always know the enormity of the task they faced and the satisfaction of a job well done.